in that sketch, the actors disagreed with how to argue. This actually is an ancient problem. The philosopher Plato was highly critical of the sophists who were professional educators that enhanced their reputation by winning arguments. They used clever deceptions to lure their opponent into word traps or used words that would persuade or impress an audience. They had no interest in the pursuit of truth. Truth and deception are very old opponents. These days, we have our own spin on truth and fake truth that is shadowed by polarity. Polarity can be tribal, rigid, and biased beyond reason. So I'm going to concede at the start that there is no arguing your way past polarity. I'll explore disagreements, misunderstanding, and the, the dynamics of how even polarized perceptions in a collective consciousness can change. I'll start with disagreements. Simple disagreements can seem minor, so much so that we agree to disagree and just let it go. Or we disagree and negotiate a resolution over time. Accepted rules of negotiation, such as active listening, may be useful. More stubborn disagreements can arise in human discourse. And when we can't solve a stubborn disagreement, one solution is to allow that we disagree in a select area, but hold common ground in many other areas. As long as there is opportunity for an honest exchange of opinion and active listening, I would suggest we are still in the realm of civil disagreement. When a person's perception or polar person's perception or identity become fixed or totally identified with tribal think, we are entering the realm of polarity. I don't have to tell you that polarity can disrupt civil discourse and even civilization itself. If overcoming polarity were easy, we'd have done it by now. For over a decade, Krista Tippett has hosted civil dialogue where apparently deeply polarized individuals engage in civil discussion, actually listening to each other. And she has presented unique case, case histories where deeply bigoted individuals have converted from rigid to open. For example, she presented the story of Derek Black and Matthew Stevenson befriending radical disagreement. In short, Derek Black was actively engaged in becoming heir apparent to his father's white power organization. Then he enrolled in a Florida liberal arts college where his racist view was more or less singular. That did not deter him at all. Then a Jewish friend invited him to their weekly Shabbat dinners. Matthew set the tone for those dinners and there was no discussion of religion or politics. Finally, after about two years, Matthew carefully questioned Derek about his racist views. Derek did not feel threatened and in a short period of time, completely converted, speaking openly about his new broad-minded views. There are other examples like this engaged and non-threatening friendships becoming the basis of an open-minded conversion over time. This may be a slow social path to change, but it must be said, short-term discussions rarely result in change. Here's a good example. Buddhist teacher, Jack Cornfield relates the time he was in Myanmar and had a long conversation with the leading Buddhist monk who was organizing violence against Muslims. With skillful means, Cornfield led the monk to an understanding 
that his actions were in direct conflict with the Buddhist teachings. The monk agreed to a complete cessation of violence. Cornfield left the country and the monk continued with terrorist attacks on Muslims. And now for something a wee bit different, misunderstanding. In the Monty Python film, The Life of Brian, Jesus is preaching from the Mount. Python, as the group is known for short, know that Jesus isn't using a microphone. So folks in the back may have trouble hearing. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Someone in the back asks, what did he say? And someone translates, blessed are the cheesemakers. While trying to work through their confusion, the situation escalates into misplaced aggression. Python probably understood the irony that a teaching on peacemakers could unravel into conflict. You may recall the book from 1992, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. The book highlighted basic gender misunderstandings. While clearly outdated, a Google search suggests the book still holds some relevance. I recall humorist Dave Barry describing the differences between a hunter and a gatherer while shopping. He states that he was a hunter. His goal when hunting for shoes at the mall was to navigate to the shoe store and bag a pair of shoes in the most efficient way possible and then tie them to the top of his car. His wife, on the other hand, was a gatherer. So she wanted to roam. In the process, she might discover a patch of gadgets. A gatherer was open to discovery. The hunter, while waiting for his wife at the car, might need to defend his shoes from other shoe-wearing creatures. I have a personal story about misunderstanding. Our fellowship invited someone, I'll call him Colin, to present and preside on the topic of mending disagreements. It was a mature idea. Nearly every spiritual community has faced questions of traditional structure versus change. Colin gave a talk in February 2017 and hosted a talking circle in April. He told me that he, had, he was really hoping to become a mediator and that he hoped to mediate between Republicans and Democrats in the immediate area. He hoped our fellowship would participate. In July 2017, I gave a talk on diversity, suggesting the value in understanding and celebrating the many ways to experience our world. During questions and comments, Colin became agitated and dominated the discussion. He felt diversity was misunderstood and used the immigration problems in Europe as example. He told us how the forced immigration was impacting countries and economies. People neither agreed nor disagreed with him, which seemed to cause him to press harder. I ended up spending nearly two hours with him after the service, trying to find common ground. I liked him, but couldn't understand why we weren't connecting. We ended up agreeing that Edling as a building was not ideal for a difficult mediation. But what still confused me was that I believed he wanted to be a mediator. I saw us as a couple of peacemakers, which seemed at odds with his comments on immigration. After that day, I never saw him again. I heard he'd left the country. It took me a while 
to realize my misunderstanding. I thought we were talking about globalization and diversity, but I believe his genuine fear was that immigration would get out of control and destroy economies. Our mutual misunderstanding may have hindered a deeper connection. Here's another example I've needed to digest. Apparently, two people who had meditated for decades just stopped their practice and became part of the movement that marched on the Capitol. A convergence of circumstance altered their worldview. Maybe you know someone like that, someone who seemed at least moderate, but unexpected challenges threw them into unconscious territory. If you are their friend, try to guide them to a safer place, a place you would choose together. You might find yourself back in the realm of discerning disagreement with safe and solid sanctuaries where you can still be friends. Whatever is happening on the surface, experts seem to agree that group perception is influenced by tipping points. Tipping points occur when a small but significant number of people somehow gather momentum to the point of causing large and often important change. Malcolm Gladwell, who popularized the tipping point, suggests two factors that determine whether a tipping point will be achieved. The first is the law of the few. The law of the few suggests that a few of the right kind of people spread ideas faster. So charismatic educators, people who interact with a lot of people and persuasive salespersons are three examples of folks that might spread ideas faster. The second is the stickiness factor, which is unpredictable. No one was predicting Mr. Rogers would become so influential. Since Gladwell wrote The Tipping Point, it has, been, it has become established that human emotions, behaviors, and habits are all contagious, likely to spread and affect others in the vicinity. Love and hate are both contagious. Politeness and rudeness are both contagious. But going to the heart of the collective consciousness, there may be essential dynamics at play. For example, 1% of human heart cells are pacemaker cells that coordinate the rhythms of the entire heart. Perhaps essential qualities are built in to the flow of creative order. When it comes to the flow of collective consciousness, I believe that quality with a capital Q makes a difference. The degree to which individual insight holds excellence, interconnection, or universal truths. I believe that quality has more depth than blind hate or a commitment to ignorance, which are also contagious. I understand that if a majority prefer tribalism and distracted ignorance, we will get more of the same. But I believe the seeds of quality have remarkable attributes that reflect the friendly, even grace-giving potential of an imaginative universe. Einstein reminds us that imagination is more important than knowledge. Perhaps there is such a thing as collective imagination. When collective imagination resonates with kinship, I believe it has a clear effect on various tipping points 
of the collective consciousness. Here's a stunning illustration. The transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly provides a compelling metaphor for those working to reimagine and transform organizations and larger systems into a restored and integrated whole. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Satoris, an evolutionary biologist, shares the metaphor. I'm combining and clarifying quotes. She states, my favorite metaphor for the transformation of our world is that of a butterfly in metamorphosis. It goes like this. A caterpillar crunches its way through its ecosystem, cutting a swath of destruction by eating as much as hundreds of times its weight in a day until it is too bloated to continue and hangs itself up, its skin then hardening into a chrysalis. Inside this chrysalis, deep in the caterpillar's body, imaginal cells begin to form. Not recognizing the newcomers, the caterpillar's immune system wipes them out as soon as they rise. But more of them keep coming and then begin linking up with each other. It isn't until they begin to link forces and join up with each other that they get stronger and are able to resist the onslaught of the immune system. Then the caterpillar's immune system fails from the stress. The imaginal cells have reached a critical mass and a new and very different kind of creature, the butterfly starts to form. It took a long time for biologists to understand the reason for the immune system attack on the emerging butterfly cells. Eventually, they discovered that the butterfly has its own unique genome that is carried invisibly by the caterpillar. Inherited, yes, but not yet part of it. Cells with the butterfly genome were held as stem cells that biologists call imaginal cells, hidden inside the caterpillar all its life, remaining undeveloped until the crisis of overeating, fatigue, and breakdown allows them to develop, gradually replacing the caterpillar with a butterfly. Not all chrysalis hatch into butterflies. There are very few imaginal cells at the start. And if they are not able to connect, they are dispatched by the immune system and the chrysalis dies. But it's the mysterious ability of those few cells knowing how to find each other and then acting together that generally assures transformation. If we see ourselves as imaginal cells, working to build the butterfly of a better world, we will understand that we are launching a new pattern of values and practices to replace a system that extracts natural resources at an unsustainable pace. We will also see how important it is to link with each other in the effort, to recognize how many different kinds of imaginal cells it will take to build a butterfly with all its capacities, capabilities, and colors. I'll say this again in a slightly different way. A bloated, greed-driven system will eventually break down. Perhaps the vision of a new and very different world is held by many imaginal cell humans who dream of transformation. New solutions to the crisis of overconsumption, overconsumption can emerge over time, like the growth of a butterfly. When Einstein suggests the importance of imagination, he was not just dreaming. He was setting a pattern that he tested in the world, imaginal patterns through which he lived his life. 
those imaginal patterns remained alive until they gained momentum in the collective consciousness, influencing science, social, and spiritual perception. I'm suggesting that if we embrace imagination, interconnection, and universal truths to whatever extent possible, we can act like imaginal selves of the collective consciousness and contribute to radical transformation. We can actively imagine human consciousness evolving into a self-organizing, intelligent, and interconnected whole. The butterfly metaphor suggests that if you want a world with wings, connected by the flow of benevolent breeze, don't spend your energy trying to step on the caterpillar, just fighting against patriarchal or status quo interests. Allow your imagination to weave a pattern in the world. Be prepared to allow collective imagination to inform your life. Please be prepared to allow collective imagination to inform your life. Join forces with other imaginal cells in whatever way makes most sense for you to build a better world, a better future for us all. Thank you for your kind attention.